Is America on the brink of a new civil war? You keep hearing this everywhere. Um, people are talking about it uh, in political chats and political places. This article is from CNN, and it, so it's, it's from a uh, kind of a left-wing uh, tint. I also go into um, kind of what the right's talking about this as well. But both sides, whether you're Democrat, Republican, everybody thinks that we're headed for a civil war in November. Americans are living through truly historic times. The COVID-19 pandemic protests um, catalyzed by the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, the national embrace of Black Lives Matter 2.0, and the um, specter of black-clad federal law enforcement officers engaging in pitched battles against peaceful mothers purposefully dressed in white, all of which can be refracted through America's original sin of racial slavery. I love how CNN frames this um, story right from the beginning. They turn it into a kind of a race baiting story, um, which I have a hard time with. I think CNN really hurts themselves when they pander so blatantly to one side. Um, Americans are living in an era when efforts to forge a new national identity, what uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Junior characterized as a beloved community free of racial injustice are directly confronting deeply entrenched national myths rooted in white supremacy. We are in the midst of what amounts to America's third, uh, America's third reconstruction. Of course, he's referring to the reconstruction that started to happen immediately after the Civil War, but was derailed right later by President Johnson. And... Um, wasn't taken up again until the civil rights movement of the um, 60s, 50 or 60s basically. And then um, I guess they're saying it was abandoned once again at some point and now is being taken up again nowadays. But um, I think <laughs> what this author is doing is mischaracterizing the message of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, I think Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s message was that all men um, are treated the same regardless of their skin color, not as a result of their skin color. So white man or the white child and the black child can play together and they're judged not on the color of their skin but on the content of their character. That was his dream that he had. In the wake of the Civil, of the civil War, the original Civil War, the architects of Reconstruction from 1865 to 1877 made a valiant attempt to create a new interracial democracy. It faltered in the face of brutal violence, legal decisions that assaulted black citizenship, and a political system that reinforced racial divisions thought to have been eradicated after the war. In the years that followed, segregationists directed Confederate monuments, massacred black towns, and imposed a um, a version of American history rooted in vicious racial myths that became part of our national culture. Um, again, this is definitely catering to the far left fringe, this article. There's no question that what I'm reading so far caters to the far left fringe, but we need to understand both sides. And if we refuse to listen to what this guy is saying in this article, then we're, it's a disservice to trying to understand what's going on in our country right now. Americans' uh, second reconstruction, the civil rights movement, um, um, heroic period in the 1950s and 60s, attempted to combat the um, symbols of um, substance of white supremacy and anti-black racism, but its mission, um, despite watershed legal and legislative victories like Brown versus Board of Education and the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights and Fair Housing Act remains incomplete. Um, Americans third reconstruction, well first let's let's just um, focus on what's in, what he doesn't say in here. Both the reconstruction after the Civil War and the Civil Rights and Vote um, Act of the 1960s was passed through the House um, with overwhelming Republican support. And I think leaving out that narrative does an in-service to our history. Um, trying to paint Republicans as a racist party when Republicans are literally the party that won the Civil War, the party of Abraham Lincoln, the party that passed the civil rights legislation of the 1960s. A lot of people don't like to hear that, but that is the true history. 
the Civil Rights Act passed because of Republicans. In fact, the Democrats pretty much wanted it abolished because in the 60s, um, the South was more Democratic, uh, was and um, and Democrats were more the party of um, keeping um, segregation going. Uh, I'm not saying what the parties are today, but I'm saying historically, that is the truth. But a lot of times, historical writers like this guy who's writing a little bit about history leaves that out, and I think um, he's leaving it out because of a agenda that he has and I'm not trying to promote one side or the other I'm not saying that nowadays in our current society that whether the Republicans and the Democrats are the same as they were in the 1960s or in the 1860s but that's just historical fact America's third reconstruction began with the soaring promise of Barack Obama's 2008 presidential election and the victory of a campaign that millions took to be the definitive symbol of historic racial progress. Dreams that a black president could prove transformative to national uh, race relations proved short-lived, and the emerging Black Lives Matter movement during Obama's second term exposed the limited impact of a black first family on entrenched systems of oppression. Um, well, he's painting this art, he's painting this picture, which I kind of disagree with. I think that um, some of his policies that, I mean, we had a, the first black president, but this black president was enacting policies that hurt the black communities. Um, so I think that leaving that out is uh, doing a disservice to where this, um, to, to, to the, to actual history. The 2016 election of uh, Donald J. Trump uh, revealed the depth and breadth of uh, racial um, resentment and fear among those who correctly interpreted the phrase Make America Great Again as the call for a restoration of white supremacy. Okay, so I would definitely disagree with that. I do not think the phrase Make America Great Again was a call for the restoration of white supremacy because then um, keep in mind that Ronald Reagan used this same phrase, Make America Great Again, and so did Bill Clinton during his campaign. He used the phrase, Make America Great Again. So was Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton also calling for a restoration of white supremacy? And when he writes correctly interpreted, I have huge issue with that. So we, we already see where this CNN article is going. It's stirring up racial division in our country rather than accurately report on history. The Redeemer of the South of Reconstruction um, devoted to the removal of gains made by African Americans updated for a digital age. That's what to make it. <laughs> so I'm having a hard time reading through this article just because it's so clearly biased in one direction. And it's almost like this article is promoting the next civil war, which I have a hard time with. This is why CNN is just losing respect among anybody who's an independent-minded person like me. This year has ushered in the most dynamic social movement for racial justice in American history as Black Lives Matter 2.0 awakened the entire nation to the reality of white supremacy, made more <laughs> legible to millions of white Americans who, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, shelter-in-place orders and mass unemployment shows new layers of empathy and taking the streets to protest against the killing of George Floyd. In 2008, if 2008 reflected hopes that one black leader could transform racial injustice from the inside out, 2020 bears witness to the power of millions of Americans seeking fundamental transformation of systems of racial injustice from the bottom up. This year of plague racial this year of plague, which is referring to the COVID-19, racial justice protests and violence has hastened America's moral and political reckoning with over a century of long-standing monuments, um, citadels, and symbols of white supremacy that have narrated myths about our national collective, our nation's collective past. The 1619 Project, the New York Times Multimedia 
history of racial slavery and um, democracy since the arrival of the first enslaved Africans in Jamestown Colony, Virginia, has become the latest battleground in our long-running cultural war over the very meaning of freedom, democracy, and citizenship. Um, conceived by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Nicole Hannah Jones, the project sought to uncover the deep and broad roots of racial slavery and its aftermath on American democracy in ways that have been forgotten, ignored, and distorted. Published in August 2019. Let me stop right there. It's just so funny that they use that sort of phraseology when literally this article is distorting history by leaving out very important things like that the fact that you know the um, they left out that um, you know the the party of Lincoln is the Republican Party the party that passed the um, Civil Rights Act is the Republican Party Martin Luther King Jr. was a Republican you can't just delete that from history like they are so clearly doing published in 2019 the 1619 project quickly went viral becoming a much needed teaching tool to help public school teachers avoid glossing over America's brutal history of racial slavery and Jim Crow. Um, the project brilliantly explored slavery's relationship with capitalism, the creation of a racial caste system, and the perpetuation of disparities in wealth and health care that are based on systems rooted in bondage. Readers of the 1619 Project come away with a better and historically sophisticated understanding of how slavery fo fostered supply chains of power and privilege for whites and misery and grief for blacks in ways that have received dedicated scholarly attention, but comparatively scant public debate. Tom Cotton, the U.S. Senator from Arkansas, who publicly called for the use of military troops to rout racial justice protesters, um, in the spring has introduced legislation designed to prevent the teaching of the 1619 Project in public schools. In denouncing the 1619 Project as an anti-American, he characterized slavery as a necessary evil that the founders realized would be ended one day, citing Abraham Lincoln as validating this perspective, comments he later tried with dubious success to walk back. Um, there's, <laughs> I guess, fireworks. Rodney Floyd stands in front of a hologram honoring his brother uh, as it is projected over the Robert E. Lee statue in Richmond, Virginia. Interesting. So that's a holograph. The poverty of cottons. I'm, I'm hoping you saw that. Yeah, that's the holograph there. The poverty of cottons historical explanation is surpassed by the... Um, mendacity of his decept, uh, descript, description of uh, racial slavery, a practice which slaughtered, maimed, killed, and raped, and crushed the bones, but not the spirits of generations of black human beings. The Civil War's gruesome death toll of more than 600,000 Americans obliterates his assertion that the founders realized that slavery would one day be removed from the face of the Republic. Slavery, far from being an inevitable or necessary evil, proved to be a system that flourished thanks to thousands of personal, political, and policy choices made during the antebellum era, and that the 1619 Project rightfully exposed as segregation and poverty that persists to this day. Lincoln's soaring and concise second inaugural, inaugural address in 1865, in which he observed that every drop of blood drawn by the lash shall be paid by another drawn by the sword, remains a testament to the high price paid to settle once and for all whether the United States would embrace freedom or slavery, and since the war reflected that a house divided against itself proved destined to fail. Parts of America still remain divided against itself. Cotton's effort to impugn the 1619 project formed the latest effort in a war over a narrative that began as soon as the Civil War ended. While the North won the physical battle, the South proved victorious in retelling the story of racial slavery to future generations. The lost cause has proven tenacious enough that even 21st century schoolchildren are frequently taught that the Civil War was fought, fought, fought over states' rights instead of racial slavery. I don't know what he's talking about there. 
everybody knows the Civil War was fought over slavery. I don't think that children today are taught that it was about states' rights. I do know that um, the South did, um, right from the get-go, put out the narrative that it wasn't about slavery, it was about states' rights. And to back that up, there are historical accounts, many, in fact, there's some that are even on YouTube from videos that were made in the early 1900s about, um, because in the early 1900s, a lot of the veterans from the Civil War were still alive, so there was actually video footage taken of veterans of the Civil War talking about their experience in the Civil War. And there are several that I've watched of, of uh, former slaves, black slaves from the South that were fighting for the Confederacy. And they gave the reason why they were fighting for the Confederacy because of states' rights. So um, to say that there were not a dual purpose for the Civil War, both freeing the slaves and states' rights, is a complete uh, uh, rewriting of what actually happened, much like this author is doing throughout this article, from not acknowledging that Abraham Lincoln was a Republican, that Martin Luther King was a Republican, that the Republicans passed the civil rights, the Republicans were the ones that fought the Civil War. All that is left out because of an agenda-based narrative that this CNN reporter is trying to promote, right down to this. The Civil War was fought over states' rights instead of racial slavery, which is, um, both are true. Both are true. And you can't ignore that. That is just the facts of history. You can't rewrite history. Neither side can rewrite history, including the CNN author. The 1619 Project refutes this hollow narrative, narrative victory with a national history that reflects the bitter fruits of racial slavery and violence, as well as the beauty of generations of black Americans who helped reimagine democracy with an um, in, uh, not, uh, indefatigable, uh, mad, uh, indefatigable, indefatigable, which basically means a very persistent um, will. Slavery represented an incomprehensible moral and political evil. One that uh, the founders, subsequent um, the founders, subsequent presidents, abolitionists, and ens enslaved Black Americans wrestled and debated, but it was never a necessary one. Suggesting otherwise perpetrates the acceptance of slavery's legacy. To believe otherwise is to endorse the continuum of a seemingly unbroken chain of wrong turns and bad choices made collectively by a nation that has remained until as recently as a few months ago, willfully blind to the racial sins of the past. So you can just see where they're framing this. This is uh, framed as America is this evil place that never dealt with uh, slavery and racial injustice until very recently after George Floyd, I guess, died. Um, I do think that there is obviously still um, remnants of racism left in our country, but for the most part, it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. The only place you can even remotely say that it exists is maybe because in the prison system, the majority of people are African-American inmates. And um, in a lot of the larger cities, especially cities like Chicago and Rochester and New York, uh, bigger cities, Los Angeles, um, there is um, a lot of uh, black men that are being killed mainly by other black men. Um, so there is definitely um, an economic divide that still exists, but the way that this author is framing w is that is framing it is that America is just this evil country. Cotton's words remind us that 
A narrative war continues in our own time. The culture war of the 21st century, like past conflicts centered around public interpretations of history, is a tool to make sense of the present in service of envisioning the country's political future. America's third reconstruction, like its two earlier iterations, represents a time for choosing moral sides. Millions of Americans across the nation have and are continuing to do so in unprecedented numbers of demonstrations, protests, and marches advocating racial and social injustice. The choices ahead of us is a stark now is as stark now as it was in the eve of the Civil War. America can choose a liberated future that acknowledges past racial sins and a generational effort at atonement and repair, or we can double down on the same willful blinders that got us into this mess, aiding by rationalizations that describe incomprehensible evil as the cost of doing business. I would offer that what's got us into this crazy mess is articles like this and sentiments like this that completely ignore history. This article, to me, written by this CNN author, 100% is trying to stoke up racial divide in our country. It's almost like it's uh, he's predicting that we're on the eve of a civil war, and then he's stoking that civil war, almost hoping that it happens. I mean, in mischaracterizing demonstrations, protests, and marches as something noble, when in fact a lot of these demonstrations, protests, and marches are turning into um, public property destruction, looting, arson um, and uh, trespassing on private property just complete criminal activities that's not written in here so you can't ignore what I mean we have two eyes we can see what's going on and while a lot of while some of what's in this article is important to understand especially the fact that there is still racial injustice in our country there is still some ghosts of slavery that, and um, ghosts of segregation that we need to address. For the most part, we, don't, we live in a post-racist society. We elected an African-American president to be... That doesn't happen if we live in a racist society. That means that more than 50% of the population voted for... Um, Barack Obama. And if you even say that everybody who voted against Barack Obama had racist tendencies, then we're, that, would, that would still put us in a post-racist society. But, um, but that's not even true. I mean, the majority of, I mean, re Republicans and the majority of Democrats all are post-racist. They don't have a racist bone in their body. But let's go on. Here's more of a perspective from the right. This is uh, Glenn Beck. He made this video, Civil War, The Way America Could End in 2020. And uh, this is a video which I cannot play because I don't want to, um, you know, use copyrighted material. But this is going to be released in September 16, which was yesterday. So I encourage everybody to watch this, Civil War, The Way America Could End. Um, this little write-up on it is, we, we're, um, oh. we're being set up for a civil war. The less, the, and this is the right's perspective. The, le the left is grooming us for um, an Eastern European style revolution this election. And they're not even trying to hide it anymore. The playbook for mainstream USA is the exact same that has been used in places like Ukraine, initiated by the same people in order to completely upend the American system. Glenn takes us through a tale of three chalkboards that will, Glenn Beck loves his chalkboards, that will connect the dots, the um, Obama administration, Ukraine, the State Department's relationship with George Soros, Black Lives Matter, and Antifa, riots and the Great Reset, public school indoctrination, mail-in voting, it all points to something dangerous happening in November if we don't act now. So I would encourage 
everybody to definitely watch this video about um, kind of the conservative uh, viewpoint on where our country is going right now. This is a, also a, a fascinating article written by the National Interest, um, How to Avoid the Second American Civil War. And I think this is an important um, to, to, to understand because and to go through. Uh, because if there's any way to avoid a second, I mean, the first civil war had so much bloodshed. Anything we can do to avoid a second civil war, which I think is coming, I just, I don't think either side will be happy with how this election turns out. If Trump wins, the left will lose their mind. If Biden wins, the right will lose their mind. This November, a second American civil war could erupt when one side loses the election and the other side takes to armed resistance and looting. Um, in politics, as in sports, defeat can be snatched out of the jaws of victory. On the surface, the Black Lives Matter protests in the wake of the murder of George Floyd appear to many to have accomplished dem demonstrable things, galvanizing a productive and long overdue national conversation, achieved prominent um, legislative successes, eliminated racist um, um, shibboleths, and meaningful and meaningfully moved public opinion on issues from systematic racism to qualified immunity. This sea change in discourse is nothing short of remarkable, yet there are structural reasons to be fearful that the opening salvo in the American, the second American Civil War has already been fired. President Donald Trump's recent executive order is unlikely to assuage tensions between protesters and police, quite the opposite. Both its framing and various historical precedents tell us to expect a hardening of the debate into two polarized camps with reason, compromise, and centrism all left by the wayside. Discussing and planning for a further escalation of violence is not alarmist or defeatist. It is, in fact, the only sensible way to avert it. Interesting way to open an article. Um, contemporary Civil War and geostrategically politic, um, located po politi politics have all been inadvertently um, inadvertent outcome of mass protest movement that misfired after successfully achieving most or all of the movement's initial aims. Recent events in Ukraine and the um, Arab world present dangerous omens, even after achieving their state, stated goals. Postmodern protest movements have occasionally in, in, engendered the collapse of their um, polities. I feel like they want to say policies or politics. On the loss of previous freedoms as in Hong Kong due to their scale and ripple effects throughout society. The future of our Republic may hinge upon the various uh, structural factors at play in these uh, BLM protests, Black Lives Matter protests. Right now, the fundamentals look very precarious. Indeed, the protests also leave the American electoral process ripe for foreign interfer interference. At their essence, mass protests are symbolic demonstrations of power. A group or coalition of groups unified by a shared goal choose to gather visibly to demonstrate their potential physical or electoral forces. Protests achieve their goals most sustainably when at least three out of four conditions are met. One, coherent leadership. Two, concrete and immediate implement, um, implementable demands. Three, having opponents in power who can read what the protesters want and are potentially open to compromise for support from the wider community which will grow stronger with time the longer and more visible disruptive in the protests become leaderless protests leaderless protests occasionally can sustain a success in all if all three of the other conditions are met as with the arab spring in tunisia however that is the exception which proves the rule. Generally, 
Because the leaderless protests emerge from a coalition of diverse interest groups, they fail to articulate their demands effectively. If protesters are both leaderless and lack clear achievable goals, such as the Occupy Wall Street movement or today's protest, then they are an enormous disadvantage. One which no amount of sheer numbers or the righteousness of their cause can compensate for. Furthermore, when facing off against opponents, why do not acknowledge the protesters symbolic power a protest can easily spiral out of control leading to an unintended civil war or the potential destruction of the pol of polarity as in ukraine today's worldwide protests present lack presently lack any of the four conditions for protest movements to achieve to achieve sustainable change we must re remember that in the 2014 the Euro Maiden protests in Ukraine, all four conditions were met in the protests still occasionally a bloody civil war. Um, occasioned a bloody civil war, foreign intervention, and the irrevocable destruction of Ukraine's territorial integrity. The protests of the last two weeks have unleashed an unbelievable power um, genie capable of granting nearly any wish the protesters might ask for, but for their wish to be granted permanently rather than um, ephemerally, the right structural factors must undergird their request to the genie. The most relevant case study to examine the role of structural factors is another example of a cross-class multi-generational protest movement sparked by a single instance of, sim of symbolic um, Oh, now I lost where I was. Single instance of systematic injustice, which was filmed on a smartphone, which then spiraled spawn, or spawned local protest, then in turn um, sparked myriad of copycat protests in neighboring states. That was the 2011 Arab Spring protest, whose outcomes can be divided into two rough um, typologies. Those which faced regimes willing to listen and compromise the, the Egypt and um, to Tunisia and those which did not, Syria and Libya. In all four cases, the protesters were leaderless but had a coherent, extremely legible demand. Um, Asha Barudu Al Nizami, the people demand the fall of, the re of, of that re regime. The protesters held it on placards, they screamed it, and they chanted it. In the Tunisian case, the regime of authoritarianism, strongman, President um, uh, Abedin Ben Ali, grasped the symbolic power in the peaceful protesters. Initially, he offered them a small compromise. The protests grew. Much of the army, trade unions, the civil society had come to side with the protesters. They signaled that if Ben Ali stayed in place, their support for the movement would grow further. Ben Ali heard the protesters' message and simply left the country. In Egypt, the situation was roughly similar, although the regime attempted a violent crackdown, which backfired, causing President Hussani Mubarak, who rose to power throughout through the ranks of the military, to be abandoned by his army. In Libya and Sir Syria, the leaders were unwilling to bend. They insisted that they remained popular and refused to acknowledge the protesters demands of legitimate as legitimate mumari al Qaddafi in uh, basar al-assad shot into peaceful crowds causing protests to become militarized and take the form of a violent uprising um, that sol um, solicited outside military support as, he, as his forces were hemorrhaging territory in late February 2011, Gaddafi proclaimed two mutually contradictory realities. One, that they were, there were no demonstrations at all. And two, that they loved, or, or, and that they loved me, all my people loved me, and they will die to protect me. And also, and also two, Gaddafi would personally oversee the hunting down of the protesters street by street, house by house, and massacre them all. One does not need to have devoted his life to a study of Libya to know that this story 
has not ended well. In Libya, the initial protesters in Benghazi were largely civil rights lawyers with well-articulated and justified grievance, grievances, yet um, they were unable to control the outcome that they indirectly occasioned. In Syria, the situation has been more tragic still. Peaceful protesters demanding gradual reforms were shot by the regime, leading to violent uprisings organized on a largely sectarian basis, which led to nearly a decade of civil and proxy war in which more than half of Syrian's population has either been killed or displaced. The well-intentioned leadership, leaderless protesters inadvertently provided an excuse for a wannabe autocratic autocrat to destroy their country beyond recognition what i don't like about this article is that it's comparing the, these middle east um, uprisings to what's going on in the united states right now i don't see the comparison but let's continue protests are inherently sloppy as david meyer has pointed out but what today's protesters really want is order not the reigning chaos where white officers repeatedly kill blacks with impunity and then have their police unions prevent fair trials, yet merely having a just cause isn't sufficient when confronting specifically intractable opponents in the White House. Governors, mansions, the state, the Senate, state legislatures, and mayoral offices. Most crucially, many Americans will grow tired of the protesters as well. They will come to be blamed for a second wave of the coronavirus which i think is happening i think that americans have grown tired of all these protesters they're sick of it because night after night they turn from quote peaceful protests into violent insurrections and america is just getting they're done with it hence as they are currently structured, all four of the key variables, opponent, leadership, clarity of demands, and time, are not on the protesters' side. The United States is not Syria, Ukraine, or Libya, but if the protesters do signal clear demands after which they will um, disperse and the top individuals in power either refuse to accept the meaning of the protesters' symbolic show of power, then the protest is likely to miscarry invite foreign interference, and lead to unintended and unpredictable consequences. No one can say how this will all end. There could be false flag operations like a modern-day Reichstag fire, or Assad bombing civilians claiming he is attacking ISIS, or terrorist attacks from insurgents, the authorities, or outside actors. There has already been um, reactionary vigilantism, further police brutality and widespread vandalism, this November a second American Civil War could erupt when one side loses the election and the other takes to armed resistance or looting. To decrease the likelihood of the collapse of our um, politics, polity, I don't, I don't know what that word is and this author keeps using it, polity. It doesn't look like a word to me. I'm going to look it up right now. All right, it's pronounced polity, and it's a civil form of government. If the protesters truly desire a sustainable <clears throat> resolution for their justified grievances, then they must anoint a hierarchical leadership to negotiate with those states, local, and congressional authorities they feel can be trusted to reach immediately implemented compromises in exchange for um, dispersal of the movement. Otherwise, the recent historical precedents do not bode well for the protesters, their aims, or the policy. If, God forbid, the worst happens, then the road to a second American Civil War will have been paved with good intentions. Um, that's an interesting article, and I do not like where the article went, but it's a valid point. Um, I mean, if that's truly how the left of the country feels about the right or the Trump administration, they feel like he is equivalent to, you know, some of these dictators and horrible people from the Middle East, then I'd say there's two issues here. Number one, why do they think that? And number two, 
how do we correct them of that? Um, I think obviously the reason they think that is because there's a narrative out there that's saying that Trump is, war, you know, the second coming of 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 the Nazi leader, and uh, I'm not sure if I can use his name without this video um, receiving demonetization, but. Um, um, and then how do we change their mind? I think when there's articles like this written or articles like um, the CNN person wrote, I think uh, uh, all it does is feed that narrative. And it's scary. Winning the cold civil war. The cold civil war. As Florida gubernatorial, gubernatorial candidates, Ron DeSantis and Andrew Gillum shook every bush and tree to find the votes necessary to claim the state house. Further down the ballot, Amendment 4 cruised to a decisive victory with over 64% of the vote. Why did Gillum and DeSantis supporters, including lifelong Democrats as well as those wearing MAGA hats, align to restore voting rights to 1.4 million Floridians convicted of felonies. In previous writing, we introduced the idea of community wealth building as a promising policy paradigm to challenge long entrenched inequities and reinvigorate the practice of democracy, starting at the community level. Our vision of community wealth building marries an explicit commitment to inclusive democracy to a practical focus on meeting community needs Executing this paradigm requires making a commitment to civic um, participation, establishing bold equity goals, and taking a holistic approach to building wealth for both communities and individuals. What happened in Florida underscores both the need for and the promise of this way forward. Our approach requires individuals from diverse backgrounds working in close proximity to engage with one another, to debate, to disagree, to build consensus, and ultimately to build community, while focusing on the fundamentals, jobs, housing, education, opportunity. Deep and dramatic change becomes possible when narrow partisanship gives way to sustained engagement and a broader consideration of the public good. The absence of such engagement and the understanding of politics as equivalent to partisan scorched earth posturing is part of the deep backdrop that allowed Donald Trump to emerge as a political force. While Democratic control of the House of Representatives will be a significant check on the president taken as a whole, the recent election has done little to change the overall trajectory of our stalemate, stalemated politics. Festering beneath the political divide is what some are even calling a cold civil war. Always present is a persistent centuries-old refusal to accept the idea of America as an inclusive multicultural democracy. I don't think that's true. I think this author is wrong there. Division and anger have surfaced as defining characteristics of our national identity. Stoked by economic hopelessness, um, frustration around the loss of perceived American exceptionalism, and in some cases cynicism about the um, democratic experiment itself. Tragically, this partisan and cultural divide character characteristically um, uh, pits Americans who today feel threatened by the loss of their American dream against those Americans who have never been fully or equitably um, included in that dream in the first place, even though all have to a considerable degree, common interests and common concerns. To bridge our cultural and political chas chasm, we must articulate and embrace a vision that more directly connects our common aspirations to public life, so that politics can once again become a tool for building better communities, not a weapon of cultural destruction. Whereas many see a nation um, or many see a nation, sorry, I keep losing my place here. Whereas many see a nation implacably divided into red and blue America, community wealth building illuminates a path forward.
for urban communities, suburban communities, small towns, and rural areas, all facing common challenges and sharing common aspirations to live in a safe, affordable communities, rich in economic opportunity that will lead to a better future for generations to come. This is the approach um, the impressive and determined organizing campaign and support of the Amendment 4 took in Florida. Campaigners showed how everyone, people of color, whites, the young, the old, suffers when some are disenfranchised. In addition to a firm moral message in favor of a second chance, um, the campaign showed diverse examples of the human faces of disenfranchisement, and it demonstrated how current policies undermine rather than enhance public safety. A broad-based coalition thus used the power of stories and an instance of inclusion and decency to remove a major impediment to democracy. To move forward as a nation, we will need much more where that came from. The challenge of our time is to knit together a compelling vision that speaks directly to the concrete needs of urban, suburban, and rural communities, while emphasizing participation and engagement at the community level. We do not pretend for a moment that this process will or should be conflict-free, but in many cases the process change can be a win-win in um, which everyone benefits from improved community outcomes instead of a zero-sum we also reject go f go it alone localism far from diminishing the federal role we believe federal policy must remain not only the guarantor of essential rights and liberties but must also provide a robust well-resourced policy architecture to support community wealth building efforts america can no longer tinker around the edges of our grand civic um, challenges both the national results and the breakthrough in Florida only strengthen our conviction that the underlying causes of, dem of de democratic decay must be met head on if we are to realize a democracy marked by the genuine expansion of inclusion and opportunity and to invigorate our capacity for inclusive self-government. Melody Barnes, who, who wrote the, this article um, is the co-director of the University of Virginia uh, Democratic Initiative. She's a professor of practice at the Miller Center for Public Affairs. Also, Thad Williamson um, is an associate professor of leadership studies at the University of Richmond and author of Sparrow Justice and Citizenship. Um, this is an interesting article that focuses on um, making sure that we have an inclusive democracy and social justice is part of that and also um, giving people a second chance that have messed up is part of that which i think is definitely part of it i don't think it's all of it but it's a it's a good point um i think the un the the reason why they put um the amendment for on the ballot back in I think 2018 was to get in Florida they wanted former felons people that were convicted of felonies to have the right to vote and I think that it was universally decided that that would probably help the Democrats and make it easier for them to win Florida in 2020 but um, since Trump has basically jumped on the second chance um, train and it's his policies that are giving African Americans minorities and just convicted people in general of having a second chance um, after they've been convicted do their time and then are released uh, I'm not sure that the people on the left that were hope hoping that um, amendment 4 would help the Democrats are going to get their wish because I think that now a lot of prisoners are that are given this second chance are attributing it to Donald Trump and the right that did that for them. I'm not sure, but that's just sort of the sense that I get. Anyway, I think that I've covered what I wanted to talk about in this video. You can see that um, come November, 
there is going to be something that happens. I mean, one of the two candidates are going to become our next president, whether it's Donald Trump or Joe Biden. And no matter which one wins, the other side is going to be incensed. And how they handle it, nobody can really predict. But there are a lot of people out there saying that this cold civil war that we're in is going to go nuclear. It's going to go hot. And there's going to be blood on the streets. I have a theory that one way we can avoid that is if we give one of them a landslide, whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden. If we give that person a landslide, it will knock the wind out of the other side and it will potentially help avoid a civil war. I'm not saying that a landslide is going to happen. In fact, if you look at the polls, it most certainly is not going to happen. It's going to be one of the closest elections ever. But um, and the last thing I'll say is the one single thing that we could end immediately that would eliminate any possibility of a civil war or actually I can't say that but it would drastically reduce is if we take the uncertainty out of this election and the blanket mail-in voting um, policies where they just basically print out a bunch of ballots and just mass mail them to people where there's literally if you go into an apartment building there'll be a stack of ballots like a stack of newspapers when you walk in the lobby that will create so much uncertainty in November November 4 that um, that alone could send us into a civil war so I wish the states would just do away with that if you need to do a mail-in ballot then just uh, try to get an absentee ballot where they actually mail it to a specific person it has your name on it you return it and it's counted the way that we've done absentee ballots for many 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 years but these mail-in ballots they um, they're just something that are, are only going to flame a possible civil war not help prevent it anyway let me know what your thoughts are on this I know this was, uh, I was kind of long-winded here, but um, I needed to say a lot of the stuff in there. Oh, yeah, one final thing on a different note is I really, this isn't really my passion doing this sort of political um, commentary. What I really, my passion is, is exposing um, police officers that are truly dirty. I believe that the majority of police are good, but there are some dirty cops, and the way that we can help support the good cops is by exposing the dirty cops. And if you scroll through my channel, you'll see I've made tons of videos, of, especially in my home state of Maine, of police officers that are dirty. And spread those videos around, because those officers need to lose their jobs immediately. Thanks for watching. Um, like this video, share this video, um, subscribe to my channel. I'd like to give a shout out to the main fusion center, a secret main state police department set up in the wake of 9-11 to spy on terrorists, but now spy on anybody who's a little critical of the state of Maine. They have spied on me, they've spied on um, peaceful protesters, um, they've spied on people that were against a power line going through Maine, they've spied on uh, Black Lives Matter protesters. And they are my most loyal fan. They've watched all my videos, read all my posts. So a big shout out to the Maine State Police Fusion Center. These videos do take a lot of time. I don't make money on them. So if you would not mind, go check out my website, um, nationalsi.com. And um, if you know anybody who does insurance fraud assignments, um, insurance adjusters, lawyers, um, please email me their contact information so that I can reach out to them. Um, I'm in the New England area. I'm licensed um, in uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont. I work in Rhode Island and also I'm, I'm down in the south too in Tennessee. Um, um, so any of those areas are, are great. If you know people that are in the industry, please forward their information. It would be very, very helpful. Um, also check out my store. Um, you can buy cool t-shirts and uh, mugs and different things that help support my work. I just want to get to the truth. That's my goal with every case.
with every um, story that I do. And um, the truth and uncovering the truth is very important, no matter where it leads. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare place for you. And if I go and prepare place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also.